format for today is our speaker, Dr. James Bruce, will give his talk for approximately 45 minutes, and then afterwards, uh, we'll have two mics on either side for Q&A. Dr. James Bruce is a researcher at the RAND Corporation. He is a retired senior executive with the CIA, executive officer with the CIA, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown and Florida Atlantic Universities. He also taught as an adjunct at Columbia and American Universities and as a full-time faculty member at the National War College. Dr. Bruce's lecture is entitled, Russian Covert Intervention in the 2016 U.S. Election. This is Dr. Bruce's first visit to Chautauqua. Please give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Dr. James Bruce. Uh, I do want to thank you, Barbara, very sincerely, and uh, Anita Hollick and the Women's Club for extending the invitation to me to come here and talk about this today. Uh, I, I see that the turnout was facilitated by the article in the New York Times this morning. I don't know if anybody read it with uh, Donald Trump and Putin yucking it up about the Russian, uh, they call it meddling in the election. Uh, this is my first visit to Chautauqua, as Barbara, uh, Barbara mentioned, and I certainly hope not my last. Um, I first learned about Chautauqua in a book I read some years ago by Robert Persig entitled Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> Has anybody read that book? I hope it's on, I hope it's on the, the book club's reading list. Um, I was more interested in it because of the motorcycles and the Zen. Uh, but I learned later, not long after I read the book, that Zen is safer than motorcycles. But the key thing I learned about uh, Chautauqua from Robert Persig is that it's not about bricks and mortar. Um, it's actually about uh, uh, ideas that can happen, ideas and open-minded things and learning that can happen anywhere. Uh, it can happen in the Persig book in Chicago. Uh, he refers to the Great Books program there where uh, he was evidently enrolled. Montana, California, and even, of all places, Chautauqua, New York. So uh, it's, a, it's a, just a great concept because it's about people and ideas and uh, opening minds to learning the right attitudes and as Persig emphasized, overcoming gumption traps. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. So I expect to see the interplay of all these things, but uh, particularly open minds and getting attitudes right uh, during my Chautauqua experience here. Um, I also uh, want to add a couple of caveats before I start. And, um, one of them is that these are my own personal views. I am obligated by my former employer to say that, that what I say does not represent, the, it doesn't necessarily, it just does not represent the views of uh, the Central Intelligence Agency or of the U.S. government or even uh, my, uh, uh, where I still have affiliation at the Rand Corporation. So this is, uh, this is what I think, this is what, what I'm saying, and I'm not speaking for or representing any other organizations. My knowledgeability on this subject is limited to, to anything and everything that you could have seen in the open press. I've had no access to classified information on this subject, so, um, so I, have no, I have no particular insight or knowledge. Uh, and I want to say at the outset, this lecture is not about Donald Trump. Um, it's, well, at least it's not primarily about him, but you can't talk about this subject without making uh, references to him, and of course I will in the course of the process. But I want to emphasize the principal, the principal thing that I'm addressing here is Russia and its intervention in our political processes. So this lecture is about our election process and its vulnerabilities. It's about our democracy and its resiliency, uh, or the lack of it. Uh, and it's about us, uh, who we are as a nation and who we are as a people and as a body politic. So um, I'm delighted we can save the questions until the end, and I will make uh, ample time, uh, I think, for, uh, for the period of uh, question and answer. Uh, I also want to flag a handout I, that I'm made available. I'll make references to some books along the way, books and readings. I made a short list of them, uh, uh, which you can pick up at the, at the table out there if you don't have one. And on the back, a little uh, tutorial on <clears throat> fact checking uh, for those of you that may think facts are important. And, I want <laughs> and I'll have a few things to say about facts as, uh, as, uh, as we move along. So um, November 8th, 2016 is a uh, very important day in the history of American elections. Uh, and it is important for the reasons made clear in the Mueller report. But has anybody read the Mueller report yet? 
Good, I see a sprinkling of hands. This is a really important. By the way, you can get it. It's very easy to get it. Just download it. You can get it like I did. You can download it from the internet, uh, burn up your printer, or send it to Office Depot or someplace like that, and they'll print it for you and buy it. You can go pick it up for about 75 bucks. And then you can go home and order it on Amazon for less than 10. <laughs> which, I, which, I did, which I also did, but it was too late. So it's, easy, it's, it's easily available. Uh, but anyway, the Mueller Report has a, has a very nice summary sentence that I want to read you verbatim. The Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Now, I didn't say meddled, I said interfered. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's quite, quite a difference here. So uh, I think that we need to, we need to take that, uh, that uh, into account when we try to evaluate the relative importance of November 8th, uh, 2016, and what it may mean in, the, in the American electoral history. So, um, so what I want to do today is to address four questions. Uh, because of time limitations, I won't be able to go into a lot of depth on uh, some of them, not nearly as much as I'd like. Uh, and I'm, and and some, of the, some of this presentation, I think, would probably be more effective with uh, if I could use visuals like charts and graphs and pictures of actual postings on Facebook and the internet and so forth. But in a venue like this, and with weather like this, who would, who would want to see a PowerPoint? So we'll skip that part and just uh, plunge into it, uh, uh, the words. So the, first, the four questions I want to address are, what do, what do these guys actually do? What did Putin and Russian intelligence actually do uh, to interfere in the election? I want to address the issue of, the, uh, of uh, how extensive was the cyber hacking and the injection of fake news, uh, which is now referred to by some as digital disinformation uh, into U.S. social media. I want to address the issue of collusion, and I want to ask the question, which government uh, documents have not addressed, um, what were the effects? Did this intervention affect the outcome of the election? So those are the four questions I want to address, and hopefully I'll have time at the end to go into two other issues uh, that, uh, that relate to this problem. Uh, and one has to do with the decline of facts and truth in American society. And the other has to do with how the brain works when it navigates between fact and fiction. So those are the two takeaways that I think are very important in this, uh, in this topic. So let me start with the first question. Uh, how do we know it was Russia? I know early on we were told that it could have been Russia, it could have been China, it could have been a 400-pound guy sitting in a bed, right? Well, it wasn't a 400-pound guy, and it wasn't China. It was Russia. Uh, the evidence is not just uh, overwhelming and conclusive and definitive. The fact of Russian intervention in this election is no longer in doubt. It is a fact. So, so the whole issue has been elevated to the level of fact. Now, we know this from, uh, from studies by the U.S. government, I'm going to mention two in a moment, uh, by private sector security firms, by academics who've worked on the uh, problem, uh, and by, uh, by the news media. So we have a tremendous amount of information available that, uh, that documents the factual basis of the, Russian, uh, of the Russian intervention. But I only want to refer to two, uh, to two, governments, I mean, to two government studies. Um, one of them was published uh, as an unclassified paper back in uh, January 2017. So you'll know that from that date that it was after the election and before the inauguration of the current president. This study was called the ICA, an Intelligence Community Assessment. By the way, uh, I had no, no role in this assessment. I was already, was already out of the government by that time. Um, this, uh, this study, this Intelligence Community Assessment, was uh, very substantial. It was quite lengthy, uh, and it was highly classified. That is to say, it was based on a lot of classified information, some of which was extremely uh, sensitive, hard one, and, and not, frankly, fit for public consumption. So the concept here, uh, is that when they published it to, to make it available to you and me, uh, it is a much slimmer version. It's only a handful of pages, and it's basically all the findings, same findings that are in the classified report, but they didn't present a lot of the, uh, a lot of the evidence that went with it. And uh, there's only two sentences that I want to inflict on you from that study. We assess, we meaning the U.S. intelligence community, and who is that? It's the Director of National Intelligence and three agencies, CIA, NSA, the National Security Agency, which does signals intelligence uh, in the FBI. These are the three agencies that researched and wrote this, uh, this study under the auspices of the community organization, which is called the DNI, or Director of National Intelligence. What that really means is that it is the most important government study 
that you can get from the intelligence community. That and national intelligence estimates. We assess Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. Russia's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm her electability and potential presidency. We further assess Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump. Now, uh, that, that paper, um, that study, is, a, um, is authoritative. And uh, we learned a little bit more detail about the sources from the uh, Mueller report, uh, which is the other important government study. I've already quoted the, I've already quoted the finding assessing the, the intervention as sweeping and systematic. Uh, and the Mueller report goes into some detail on the issue of the social media campaign, which sought to sow discord in the U.S. political system, undermine the election system, favor candidate Trump, and disparage candidate Clinton. Uh, Russia also staged political rallies uh, in, several, in several states. So um, you should say, well, why did they do this? What the, what's, what's going on here? The intelligence community assessment that I started quoting uh, uh, provides a bit of an explanation, and it is to undermine, undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, harm her electability, which, uh, which I've already read, and elevate the chances for... Uh, it, uh, for uh, a tr Trump victory. Now, others have also addressed the issue of motives for the intervention. One is the Steele dossier. Uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read that. Uh, he was an MI6 officer, uh, and then uh, there are others. But this whole thing, the whole concept of this intervention in, in the scheme of Russian intelligence falls under the rubric of active measures. And the Russian term for that is aktivni miropriatia, and what it has to do with is covert action. It's covert action designed to influence and manipulate outcomes, not just electoral outcomes, but other, a lot of activities uh, in foreign countries, and to do so clandestinely, in other words, to hide the hand of the intervention. So uh, we had a defector, uh, a very senior defector from the Soviet Union named uh, Oleg Kolugin. I don't know if you know the name, but Oleg was a, was a lieutenant general, a three-star general. When he, so he was the highest ranking KGB defector that, uh, that we ever had. Uh, and Kulugin himself was involved in active measures. And he defined them this way. He said, the purpose of these measures is to weaken the West, drive wedges in the Western community alliances of all sorts, particularly NATO, sow discord among the Allies, weaken, and weaken the United States in the eyes of the people of Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Well, so, so what happened in the 2016 elections fits very neatly into this idea uh, of active measures, which is to say covert intervention in a foreign country to achieve favorable results uh, for Russia. So what did, what did uh, Russia do to intervene? Uh, I've tried to lay out the basis for it and its motives, and now I want to go into a little more detail about hacking and disinformation. The disinformation, can, disinformation, DIS, Desinformatia. Disinformation is actually a formal term in the Russian uh, intelligence doctrine. Are we having a problem with information? Maybe I'll back up a little bit. So disinformation is a term in Russian intelligence doctrine uh, that has to do with infusing messaging, messaging in, uh, in foreign media that does not look like it comes from Russia. Uh, in this case, it was infused in internet sites and social media mostly with much of which was from stolen information, hacked information. So the hack, when I refer to hacking, it's just not breaking into computers. When I refer to hacking, I'm really talking about intelligence collection by means of electronic theft. That's really what hacking is. It's intelligence collection by means of electronic theft. So, um, so the disinformation campaign started in 2015. Uh, the hacking began in 2000. 2016, uh, and it was rather extensive. The agency that was conducting these activities for Russia has the initials IRA. So when you hear IRA, you probably think immediately of the Irish Republican Army. That's not this one. This is the Internet Research Agency. So when I say IRA, I'm not referring to, to Ireland, I'm referring 
to, to the Internet Research Agency in Russia. It's essentially a, a private sector contract organization that works for the GRU, which is the Russian military intelligence organization. So the IRA has been identified by the, by the U.S. government as the major entity behind the, the uh, malicious cyber act, uh, activity and the disinformation campaigns leading up to the election. Um, so between 2015 and 2017, here's a number, over 30 million Facebook users, over 30 million, let that figure sink in, users of Facebook in the United States not just saw IRA posted information, but they interacted with it. Now by interaction, I mean they clicked on it and said, I like it, or they shared it with somebody else, or they commented on it. So the concept, now this is really important, the concept of interacting with uh, Facebook postings produced by the IRA is a measure of, uh, is a measure of attention, and some would say actually effectiveness. It's very different from just looking at something and moving on. It means that you're actually engaged in it. So this is a very, a very important idea, and I'll, I will come back to this later. Now, I should mention also, more than just parenthetically, that we just don't think this. The Mueller report was so detailed, the investigation was so detailed, uh, that they actually indicted 13 people and three entities from Russia. They indicted them. Uh, we'll, never, we'll never see them here, of course. Uh, they indicted them for, for breaking U.S. law on computer intrusions. Now, the other point I would make about some of these postings is that uh, if you use Facebook, for example, you can do very targeted postings, targeting certain geographic areas. Facebook can even target specific congressional districts. And, you can, and Facebook will provide the buyers of these ads and postings with detailed feedback and information on the demographics of these congressional districts uh, and other geographic areas. So the concept, the concept of feedback here uh, is, uh, is, extremely, is extremely important. Now, on the hacking part of it, um, what, it what, uh, what I referred to before was the idea of electronic theft of data from computers. And this hacking it happened in two phases. One was a phishing expedition, that's P-H-I-S-H, phishing. Um, and then the second wave had to do with spear phishing, as I say, it was very targeted. And in the first wave, they, they, uh, they were able to identify uh, somebody who had worked on the uh, 2008 uh, Clinton campaign um, and who also was on the, then later uh, became a member of the uh, 2016 campaign. They got into this person's uh, email. When they got in that person's email, it opened up their access to many other emails and one of them went to John Podesta. John Podesta was the campaign chairman for Hillary Clinton. And uh, this is, I actually have a copy uh, of that email uh, it came from Google. Well, allegedly it came from Google. It didn't really come from Google. It came from the IRA. And what it says is, hi, John. That's a great opening. Hi, John. Someone has just used your password to sign into your Google account. Then it gives his Google address, john.podesta at gmail.com. Then it gives the details of the uh, alleged hack. Then it says, Google stopped this sign-in attempt. You should change your password immediately. Click here to change your password. <laughs> well, it's unclear whether there was communication with, with, between Podesta and his IT guy or miscommunication, but it didn't take long before that click. And once Podesta clicked on it, it gave the IRA access to all of his emails beyond what they had already stolen from the Democratic National Committee, from the DNC. So. This matters. So why do you say, well, why do these hacks matter? These hacks matter because they were leaked. And uh, about 50,000 stolen emails were, weak to, were leaked to WikiLeaks and to other websites and made available for everyone. Now, the timing of these leaks was exquisite because the first round of leaks, uh, uh, which involved 44,000 emails from the DNC, from the Democratic National Committee, occurred three days before the Democratic National Convention. It's hard to imagine better timing. But there was better timing, actually, for the second wave. And that is, uh, a month before the election, uh, WikiLeaks began publishing thousands of private emails to and from John Podesta. And when did, they, when did they leak this to WikiLeaks? The answer was one hour, one hour, after the Access Hollywood tape became public. 
Now, you remember the Access Hollywood tape, right? This was a, a I, I can't remember it verbatim, but it was something like, when you're a star, they let you do anything, or you can get away with anything, right? And, um, uh, and, uh, and much worse. So that should have been, obviously, the top priority news item of the day. It was immediately superseded uh, by thousands and thousands of uh, Podesta's emails uh, back and forth to Clinton and to others in the campaign. So um, I want to make, make a point later about uh, fake news and how it compares with, uh, with the real media news, uh, and uh, maybe we can uh, go into that in some, some detail later. Uh, I want to make uh, the, another point about, the, about collusion. Now collusion, this is the third question I want to address. Um, the Mueller report found that collusion did not rise to the level of, of prosecutable offense. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but, but in law, in law, there is no, the term collusion does not have legal standing. And the term cooperation does not have legal standing. Conspiracy does. There are conspiracy statutes that, that, would, that would get you indicted if it could be shown or proven in court um, that you had defrauded the United States by interfering with legitimate government functions, like elections, for example, right? So that was the standard that Mueller uh, could not meet. But, but there are over 140 contacts uh, documented in the Mueller report uh, between people in, people in the Trump circle, including his campaign, and, um, uh, and, and Russians. Uh, to, just to drop a few names, Paul Manafort, uh, who was his campaign chairman during this period, uh, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, George Papadopoulos, Carter Page, Jeff Sessions, J.D. Gordon, Roger Stone, Michael Caputo, Eric Prince, Avi Berkowitz, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Cohen, not Caputo, and Ivanka Trump and Felix Sater. So what you have here is a tremendous number uh, of people who were involved. Now, I'm not saying all of them were involved in collusion. I'm just saying, you know, it's worth looking at. The one collusion, inc potential collusion incident that was given great attention was the June 9th meeting at the Trump Tower. This is uh, where Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort met with uh, four Russians, one of whom was, uh, was uh, uh, Natalia Vesnitskaya, who was a Russian lawyer with connections to the Russian, uh, Russian uh, 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 judicial system. And um, nothing came of that. And I think that we actually paid more attention to that than uh, we probably should have. The meeting that we should have paid attention to, and it's, only, it's not mentioned, it does get more than a mention in the Mueller report, but we should have gone into it, I believe, in much, much more detail. This is when Paul Manafort met with a, met with a man that worked for his uh, company in the Ukraine, and his name is Konstantin Kalimnik. Konstantin Kalimnik. Now, this is a very important meeting. It happened on August 2nd, which is like two months before the election, at the Grand Havana Club in New York City. Now, Klimnik, who's a longtime business partner with Manafort, has ties to Russian intelligence. That's been established by the FBI. They discussed several things. The two most important were these. Klimnik brought with him a draft, I'm going to put this in quotes, a draft peace plan for the Ukraine. And this draft peace plan for the Ukraine essentially had to do with American acknowledgement of the legitimacy of Russia seizing the Crimea and having legitimate rights in the eastern Donbass region. In other words, ceding Ukrainian sovereignty to Russia. That was the peace plan, which Kalimnik said would require President Trump's assent if, if Trump were elected. For his part, what Manafort did in that meeting is he brought campaign information to include specific messaging strategy of the, of the Trump campaign, and he provided detailed internal polling data. Now, I don't know how detailed it was, and we don't have that uh, specific information, but we do know they discussed the battleground states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Minnesota, and we know that the voting margin in three of those states, which is to say Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, was so narrow, the total, of, total number of votes, these are the three states that threw the election to, in the Electoral College to Donald Trump, the total number of votes that did that was 77,000. Less than 80,000 votes, less than 80,000 votes determine the outcome of the elections in three states. And this is exactly where the Russians targeted precisely because of the polling data and messaging strategy provided by the Trump campaign. Now we can say legally uh, they did not establish collusion, but I say 
It's still an open question and I think deserves greater attention. And conceivably in time, we may learn, we may learn more about that. Uh, also at that meeting, uh, we, we also learned that, that, uh, that uh, Manafort shared, uh, also shared detailed polling data months before that meeting and again after that meeting. So there was extensive amount of, this is insider, insider polling data, inside information. So it raises the question about, uh, about the so-called quid pro quo, you know, which means you do something of value for me, I'll do something of value for you. Techn I, mean, I think literally it's this for that, right? Uh, what, are the, what would the Russians provide? Well, what the Russians could do and did do is to help the Trump campaign win the election by boosting his chances and diminishing Clinton's. Uh, the Russians could also provide uh, business incentives and opportunities uh, uh, and, uh, and benefits uh, to Trump and his family. And they could, and this is the argument of the Steele document, they could also provide, uh, I mean, withhold possible compromising information about Trump which is referred to in those channels as compromat. Now, what would the Russians like in return? Which is another way of saying, what could President Trump provide them? The short answer is favorable government policies, such as softening U.S. sanctions on Russia after the preceding President Obama imposed them after the seizure of the Crimea from the Ukraine, the repeal of the Magnitsky Act, which is uh, an act that is extremely troublesome to the Russians, could legitimate Russian intervention and seizure uh, in the, uh, of the, par of the par parts of the Ukraine to include the Crimea, cede Syria uh, to Russia, and to say nothing of the uh, enhanced stature for Russia and for, particularly for Putin on the international stage, you know, pretty much like uh, Kim Jong-un has gained. Now, let me turn to the fourth question, uh, which has to do with what were the effects? Did, this, did it make a difference? That's the question for us. Did, it make, did all this stuff make any difference in the election? This is a harder question. Since the bulk of the campaign dealt with messaging on social media targeted specifically at voters, we should ask, what was the electorate like? What is, the, what is the target audience here? And the answer is, <clears throat> there was a greater number of susceptible citizens in 2016 than in past years, because first, there was an unusually high level of voter dissatisfaction with the party's nominees. It was like an, an uber case of uh, the lesser of two evils for most voters. There was a higher than higher than average percentage of self-identified independents. As many as 39% of the voting electorate claimed to be independents in the 2016 election. An unusually large number of undecided voters, uh, perhaps as many as one in eight, making a decision about who to vote for in the final week of the election. I mean, this is, you have to describe this as a hugely susceptible target audience. The Russians took advantage of that by spreading volumes. Now, what do I mean by volumes? I mean hundreds of millions of widespread messaging designed to align with the Trump campaign themes and to elevate Trump and suppress support for Clinton. They also targeted particular groups to encourage polarization, in some cases voter suppression, and I've already mentioned the politically shrewd uh, timing of the release and uh, uh, stolen uh, and hacked emails. So you have to say, well, what do we make of this? I mean, how do you, how do you interpret the implications of what, uh, what this activity is? Well, what we know about Facebook statistics from 2016, from the year of the election, uh, is that 79% of internet users, which is 68% of all US adults, use Facebook. I mean, we gotta take that in and say, my God, what does this mean, right? But it's, but it's worse or better if you're a Facebook lover. A majority of Americans, according to a, the Pew uh, polling organization, which is a highly respected and reliable pollster, a majority of Americans now say they get their news media, um, they get their news from social media. Now, you gotta, you gotta think about that. Let that sink in. A majority of Americans now say they get their news via social media. 
This is a stunning fact in the, in the American body politic. More than that, one organization, actually several organizations, took the top 20, the top 20 fake news stories, the top 20 fake news stories posted by the IRA, and learned that these stories generated more activity. By, remember I talked about the interacting, right? You click on something, you say you like it, or you forward it to somebody else, or you comment on it. What they found is of these top, the 20, these fake news stories generated more interaction than the top 20 stories in the mainstream media. I mean, th this is amazing. Well, it's amazing to me. But it's particularly amazing in this election because 17 of those 20 stories originated from phony sites pre pretending to be Americans and 17 of those 20, I mean all 20 issued from phony sites, 17 of those projected either, either pro-Trump or anti-Clinton messaging. Now, according to a 2016 poll, also Pew, uh, Pew Research, 17% of those interviewed changed their views of a particular candidate because of material they had seen on social media. I mean, take that in. 17%, that's nearly... That's nearly two in ten people. Change their opinion, change their mind, change their voting choice because of the information they'd seen on social media, which is now being blanketed by a foreign adversary to, to select its own candidate. So, you know, the question we have to ask is could Russia have actually swayed enough undecided voters uh, in the swing states and elsewhere? And uh, that's, a, that's an important question. So, I think there are two really important sources, and I've mentioned them if you've if you get this, if you get this, uh, pick up this sheet that I left here. These two sources uh, are one is a, a book by Kathleen Hall Jameson, who, by the way, lectured here at Chautauqua last year. I don't think she lectured on this subject, but she should have. Uh, the book is entitled Cyber War, How Russian Hackers and Trolls Helped Elect a President. Uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson is a very serious and highly skilled and trained social scientist. Uh, and she's all about fact, not opinion. And the other important study is uh, one done by three academics, Gunther, Beck, and Nesbitt at Ohio State University. They just published the article. The article is just out. I don't know if it's online yet, but the hard copy version is not out, but uh, I had an opportunity to read it. So these two studies are extremely important. Uh, the Kathleen Hall Jameson study and the, uh, and the study by Gunther. At Ohio State. So let me summarize these findings very quickly. All right. So in her book Cyber Cyber War, uh, uh, Jameson makes the point how Russian trolls, Russian trolls with disguised identities as Americans, magnified social disruption and divisiveness, reweighted the climate of opinion against Clinton through targeted media posts, tweets, videos, so-called news, and ads. She points out that the Russian effort had a sound theory of the election needs. They were adept at extensive messaging and aligned themes with the Trump campaign, and that this all helped to frame the news and media agendas through the release of hacked information. She also points out, and, and this, is, this is really important, she also points out that the percentages, now go back, now, now you, you have to say, what does the electric look like? Who are the voters? The percentages of white evangelicals and military households who supported Trump increased over the summer, over the summer of 2016, and the number of Sanders supporters and black voters did not vote in the numbers that could have elected Clinton in the key states. In other words, we're, what we're documenting here is an actual change in the voting that's connected with social media. Black turnout was down from past years and white turnout was up. And she makes a really important point. With all of these pro-Trump factors at play, it was the late deciders who disapproved of both candidates voted disproportionately for Donald Trump. Well, I think her, I think her study is, ex, is, is exceptionally important. And the other one that I want to cite here is that Ohio State study. Now here the methodology is a little different. The Ohio State study didn't focus extensively on social media except in one way, which I'll explain in a minute. What, what, what they were, now these are political scientists. Political scientists are trained 
to try to understand voter choices. And the fundamental question is, why do people vote the way they do? And, and in particular, elections. Well, what, what the Gunther study did is they, they looked at the, what the, at the voting support for Obama, President Obama, um, in, uh, in 2012, and they said, what happened to the Obama voters? If the Obama voters had supported Clinton, Clinton would have been elected. But only 77% of them did. What happened to the rest? Well, 10% of them voted for Trump. 4% voted for minor parties, and 8% didn't vote at all. So what we're looking at here, according to, according to Gunther and, uh, and uh, his colleagues, is that this defection of former Obama supporters from Clinton was a real difference maker. Now the question is, why did they do that? And he answers the question through a survey of 1,600, a, a randomized sample, meaning that it's a representative sample. It's got some margin of error, but small. It's within the margin of error. The post-election survey was an examination of three, remember I talked about fake news, of three particular stories that were trumpeted by the IRA on social media. Message number one, Clinton is in poor health due to a serious illness. That was all over the social media. Issue number two, Pope Francis endorsed Donald Trump. Three, Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, had approved the sales of U.S. weapons to ISIS, a terrorist group of the, of the, the Islamic State. The Clinton had approved, the, okay, all three of these are untruthful. Actually, they're bald-faced lies. So what Gunther was interested in doing is asking the question, who among those who believed and didn't believe it, how did this affect their voting? And here's what his survey established. Of those who didn't believe, who didn't believe any of those three stories, 89%, which is to say 9 out of 10, voted for Clinton. Of those who only believed one of them, one of those three stories, 61% voted for Clinton. You see the drop off here, right? From 89, from let's say 9 out of 10, right? Now we're down to 6 out of 10, if you just believe one of those stories. If you believe two or three of those stories, 17% voted for Clinton. Less than two out of 10. So what this establishes is that belief in these fake news stories is very strongly linked to the defection of, of, of the Democratic voters of the, of the 2012 Obama voters from, from Clinton. Now, to be fair, in social science, correlation does not establish causation. You can't say this caused the change. But the correlation is so strong and so statistically significant, what you can say, to use an old Russian phrase, it is not by coincidence, comrade, that we have these results. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say it's more than coincidence, and causation is an extremely complicated issue, uh, but I believe had the Gunther study made an effort to examine causation in, in the conventional terms of causal analysis that social scientists can do, I think that they could have drawn the conclusion of causation. But here's the summary of that study, right? For those defecting from Clinton, believing fake news had a greater effect than anything except for one thing. Now, I want to make a point here. This study used what is called multiple regression analysis. And please, in the Q&A, do not ask me to explain this. But multiple regression is a statistical technique that allows you to examine the impact of multiple variables on a certain outcome. So that you're able to control, that's a social science term, you can control for the effects of things. This study controlled for gender, race, age, education, political leanings, and even their personal feelings about Clinton and Trump. In other words, they were able to, to use a technical term, partial out the results of these other factors. Here's the conclusion. For those defecting from Clinton, believing fake news had a greater effect than anything except being a Republican or personally disliking Clinton. They factor out all those, other, all those other variables. So what I'm saying is, from a, from a causal analysis standpoint, this is really important. The conclusion, exposure to fake news had a significant impact on voting decisions. What we know is that Clinton uh, lost the presidency. By the way, I'm not a defender of Clinton, but I'm just reporting the factual results here. 
Clinton lost the presidency by 77,744 votes that were cast in those three battleground states I mentioned, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which totals 0.6 of 1%, just to give you some idea of how slim, how narrow that margin was. So, so you can make of that what you will, but uh, let me summarize this uh, part of the talk just by way of saying that, yes, Russia did interfere, absolutely, it's a fact. Both hacking and disinformation were significant, had a significant effect, uh, a significant effect, I believe, uh, and were highly influential in voter choices. Um, was collusion a factor? Uh, well, I believe it was. But, uh, I mean, there were, it was established over 140 contacts, although it did not rise to the level of a prosecutable offense, according to Robert Mueller. I do believe that the Kalimnik Manafort exchanges uh, were, were significantly influential. And um, on the issue of the effects of the election, my opinion, I personally think it almost certainly swung the election uh, to Trump. Now, in the time I have remaining, I just want to mention two other issues. One is the concept of truth in America. Uh, the Rand Corporation recently published a study called Truth Decay. It's like tooth decay, right? It's a, it's, it was intended to be a little metaphor, right? Uh, but the concept of truth decay in America, they identified four trends. One, I did, by the way, I, I had nothing to do with this study, uh, but I think it's a very important study. It heightened disagreement, what they dis observed, heightened disagreement about facts and analytical interpretations of data in the United States. More disagreement now about what facts are. I mean, some people think there are alternative facts. Fact, counterfact. Blurred lines between opinion and fact Increased volume and influence of opinion and personal experience across the whole communications landscape and diminished trust in formerly respected institutions as sources of factual information. These are four predominant trends uh, in the United States. And then you have to say, well, if these are going on, if these trends are actually going on, what are the consequences? And here's what the study identified are the consequences of the decline of truth, of the decline of the importance of facts in American political life. One, erosion of civil discourse. Two, political paralysis at both federal and state levels. Three, individual disengagement from political and civic life. And four, uncertainty in national policy. And when you pull all those things together and say to yourself, well, what does it mean? Here's what it means. Truth decay, according to the study, poses a threat to the health and future of American democracy. Reining it in will require concentrated and interdisciplinary effort. So we have to ask ourselves about the importance uh, of truth and objectivity and fact-finding in the United States. And, and I mentioned, so on one side of the sheet is the, some of the references I've used. On the other side is a little primer on fact-finding with a mention of some of the websites that uh, do well at that. So let me conclude uh, with, uh, with, with how people come to political opinions and, and how they vote. Most of us like to think of ourselves as rational. And some of us are right. <laughs> but not all of us. <laughs> So what does the rational person do? The rational person comes at a problem like what kind of car to buy, right, or who to vote for with a dispassionate mind. You formulate your questions rigorously. You gather your facts objectively. You weigh the evidence, and you reason to logical conclusions, right? This is theory. <laughs> In practice, there are a lot of other things that intervene in this process. I mean, oftentimes we can use poor logic. Sometimes the premises of logic is, are, are, are false. We, learn, we actually mishandle facts. Prejudice gets in the way. What is prejudice? As E.B. White said, the famous writer, he said, prejudice is a great time saver. <laughs> you can form opinions without having to get the facts. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, White is right. There's a whole issue called cognitive bias, which, by the way, intelligence analysts have been studying now for several years, and it's extraordinarily 
important in influencing results. Situation change and emotions intervene. So all of these things that can interfere with the rational process happen in spades when it comes to politics. There's a, a, a political psychologist at Emory University in Georgia who studied this problem and he did it with experimentation. Uh, social scientists have a hard time doing some kinds of experiments, but here's what he did. He wanted to test the reasoning processes of political partisans. Who are partisans? They're people who are strong Democrats uh, and strong Republicans. Right? So people have strong political views. That, that was the subject of his study. And what he wanted to know is when they have strong political views, how do they manage conflicting information? So if, if you really like Hillary Clinton, for example, and you find discrepant information, things that would make you say, eh, I'm not so sure about that. How does your brain process that? If you really like Donald Trump and you find discrepant information that would lead you to other conclusions, what does your brain do with that? And here's what Weston found. What he found is that the brain figures out a way to navigate between facts and preferences, and what he calls data and desires. What he found is that when partisans face this kind of discomforting information, they reason to emotionally favored conclusions. In other words, if you want to, if you want to come out a certain way, no matter what the facts are, that's how you're going to come out. And he refers to this in his brain scan study as tracing the neural footprints. And he said when the brain registers conflict, and this is in brain scan data, when the brain registers conflict between data and desire, he says it searches for ways to reduce these unpleasant emotions. It, and it does it. It actually reduces these unpleasant emotions because it shuts down the stress through faulty reasoning. This is really important. And what it does, he says that the neural circuits turn off these negative emotions, but there's more. They also turn on positive feelings. He said the brain scan studies show a picture when, these, when the positive emotions happen, very much like what it looks like when an addict is getting a fix, which gives new meaning to a political junkie. So the point here is that the brain has really figured this out. And what the brain does is it rewards you for coming to the conclusion that you want to come to, no matter what the facts are. Now, the implications for American democracy are pretty, uh, how can I say, pretty far-reaching. So the implications here are that the political brain, this thing up here, is an emotional brain. That's the problem. And in politics, people tend to believe whatever they want to believe and they adapt their reasoning processes to get the results they want. That's the upshot of this Western study, uh, and I think it's very consequential. So let me conclude with two, two ideas here. One is that when you back up and look at the, whole, the, at the whole array of issues that ensue from the, from the Russian intervention in the election, and from the way we learn that people make political decisions, we have to back up and say, Let's see if we can draw some conclusions here. First, be wary of the political brain. Why should you be wary of it? Because you have one, <laughs> according to the Western study. And I have one. Decide what role, this is really important, decide what role you want truth and facts to play in your own decision-making framework. May, you know, if you, don't, if you don't think facts are important, that's okay. I mean, but you should know that. You should know that you're not using facts. Right? You've got to decide what role facts ought to play in the way you make these decisions. Be careful about accepting news at face value. And my advice, skip social media. I mean, use social media, but not for news. That's the one thing it can't do well. Know how to check facts. And you should demand this of others as well as yourself. Demand it from public officials. Demand it from news, news sources. Demand it from citizen activists. But don't demand it of your family and friends. <laughs> oh, I speak personally about this. <laughs> this is not a road you want to go down. I mean, not if you value relationships. And finally, I would say, is, is there anything we can do? I, this is what you and I can do, right? What can the government do? I think the government do a couple things. 
One is that the government needs, I mean, what can you do to counter the impact of Russian intervention on our next election? And one might add possibly other states as well. We need a program of unabating public diplomacy in the United Nations and NATO and in other multilateral forums. We really need to elevate this to a worldwide problem. It's not just us. We need to threaten sanctions and we need to implement them. We've got to put teeth in the punishment. We've got to put teeth in the cost of this kind of behavior. We need concerted federal and state measures to ensure the integrity of our elections. We need greatly enhanced cyber defenses. And frankly, we need an offensive cyber operations capability to deter or subvert Russian elections interference. That's a whole separate problem. It's very complex and it's very controversial. But in my view, I think this is what we need. And finally, we need better policing, and in my view, regulation of social media websites. So I would say that accepting the present sanctions that are still in place, little or nothing of these suggestions is likely in the current administration or, my, my dad, in the current polarized political environment. I wish I could end on a happier note, uh, but I can't. And possibly your questions will take us in that direction. So let me stop here and say thank you very much for, for listening and paying attention. Thank you. checking my watch here to make sure. <laughs> yeah, we have um, just a few minutes for uh, Q&A, and they will line up on either side of the microphones. And um, you can just split hey. your time yes, between. Yes, thank, thank you. I don't know if we should start with the right or left. Start over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, three things. First, thank you for your service to our country. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, second, <laughs> while nothing justifies people interfering with our elections, if you look at our history, we have interfered in other countries, elections, governments. I mean, your former employers toppled governments. The Kennedys tried to assassinate Castro and so forth. So we're not pure here, okay, uh, over, over our history, right, the last 50, 60, 70 years. But the third thing is, you were talking about how to stop this in the future. I mean, it's been said we get the government we deserve. If people are that dumb that they vote on what they see in fake news and social media, how, how you combat that? Right, okay. Uh, th th I think, let me just briefly deal with the third question first. How do we combat the issue with social media? Uh, I think I, I tried to indicate in, in my talk, uh, and I don't know if I can go, go much beyond that, yeah. because, because we as individuals assimilate this information, we do something with it, and we have to, we have to know what to do with it. And so that's why my, my simple urging is that we should never, ever, ever get our news from social media. We can, it can serve a lot of other functions and useful purposes in life and in families and so forth, but uh, not, as a source, not as a source of news. Uh, I do think we need to have, uh, I'm not an advocate for stringent government regulation, but I do think there's a, there's a role here for government regulation uh, in social media, uh, because I don't think social media, I'm talking about not just Zuckerberg and Facebook, but I'm talking about the whole panoply of, of you know, so, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and, uh, and Twitter and so forth. And what I'm saying is that I don't think they have a powerful incentive to do that. And I'm not sure they can, to tell you the truth. Um, so I think they need a little help. And I think we have, to be, we have to be cautious and careful and systematic in how we do that. But I do think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And it's not a simple problem. Now, to your point about, I think it's about U.S. covert action. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let, me say, let me say a little bit about that. Uh, U.S., yes, has, has the United States influenced elections abroad? The answer is absolutely. Yeah, we have for a, for a long time. Um, I, I've actually had access to a database of uh, 50, you, you can too, uh, 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 unclassified cases of U.S. covert action. And um, uh, I've looked very carefully at that database from the standpoint of what is the extent to which U.S. covert action has, has facilitated or impeded democratic institutions. There are five cases where, where U.S. covert action has impeded democracy. Five cases. Iran, mm -hmm. Guatemala, Chile, mm -hmm. and two other ones. But there are 37 cases where we've advanced democracy by supporting democratic movements, by supporting democratic rights. And if you study the origins of, the, of, the, of Western Europe after the Second World War, you, of course you remember the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. There was a covert action annex to the Marshall Plan 
designed specifically to develop and nourish democratic institutions uh, in France and in Italy and a number of the other democratic states. And most, uh, and, and most people who, who understand what happened here will actually credit the United States for preserving and saving democracy in Western Europe when the Russian aggressive juggernaut was rolling, had rolled through six, seven, eight Europeans, East European states and was moving west. So, so I would say the, the so-called, I'm going to put this in quotes, covert action annex to the Marshall Plan is one example of, uh, of, uh, of U.S. covert action supporting democracy. Uh, a more recent case has, uh, and there's just a book out on it now, entitled, uh, well, A Covert Action. I forgot the exact subtitle, but it's about Lech Walesa in Poland. And the question is, how did, how did Valencia and Movement Solidarity survive in an extraordinarily oppressive communist regime, and how, did, in fact, did they wind up coming to power? And the short answer is, CIA did not exactly stand on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we were decisive or influential in what happened, but Valencia has publicly acknowledged the important role the United States played in the, in, in the sustaining and the preservation of his democratic movement. Other Eastern European leaders have lauded the work done by Radio Free Europe and by Radio Liberty. These are CIA covert actions, well, at least until the program was exposed and they, then they became public. So my defense of the United States, it's not a double standard. The issue is, are, are we supporting democracy or not supporting democracy? And Russia's intervention in the U.S. election is fundamentally undemocratic and subversive of the U.S. democratic processes. Nobody disputes that. In CIA's intervention abroad, the question is, is it pro-democratic or anti-democratic? And my argument is, having, having looked at and studied the data, my argument is that the, that the lion's share of U.S. covert action abroad where you can make decisions about whether it helped or hindered democracy has been in support of democratic institutions. I hope that answers your question. Okay. To the left, and I don't mean that politically. Okay. Yep. Thank you for the excellent presentation. I'm particularly interested in the portion about political psychology. Could you give us, first of all, the name of the political sociologist? Uh, yes. Psychologist? Yeah, and if, you, and if you pick this up afterwards, okay. I've actually listed the book. It's uh, right at the very bottom. Drew Weston, W-E-S-T-I-N. Um, in fact, you can take it. Right here. Right. Thank you. Uh, Drew Weston, uh, called The Political Brain, published in 2007, and the methodology is about brain scanning. I don't know much about brain. I mean, I can tell you about the research design, but I don't know much about how to, how to use uh, brain scanning. But, uh, but brain scanning has actually turned out to be a significant methodology in a whole variety of different kinds of so social research, and I think it has a lot of credibility. But I, I think, it's, uh, to me, I think it's a breakthrough study because it has to do with understanding the cognitive processes and the, the way we reason to conclusions. And with political information, it's uh, not very encouraging. So, so my question is, people that are once deceived, like the people that were deceived by those three questions, are they not more compelled to go deeper into that uh, false belief rather than, in other words, does the derision that accompanies the Trump voter drive the Trump voter deeper into Trump advocacy? Well, I think, now by the way, I, I don't know how Drew Weston would answer that question, but let me tell you what I think. I think if you have, if I have a certain set of beliefs, uh, I look for information to reinforce them, right? So if you continually receive reinforcing information, it, 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 can, it can only harden your views and narrow your mind to those political preferences that you really like. By you and me, I'm really, I'm really talking about, about all of us. And the problem here is, and this, is, this to me is the root of the problem, our big problem is that we are homo sapiens. That's the issue, I mean, we, we, we have, our, our, the way we process information, I mean, through, you know, through hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, this is where we are now. Now, you know, maybe in another 100, 200,000 years, we won't be reasoning this way, uh, but we may not even be alive. So who the hell knows? The key point I'm trying to make here is that it's not something that you do and I do maliciously or even on purpose or, uh, or, or because we're just screwed up or uneducated. Educated people have the same, have the same processes that less educated people do. Right? The problem is that this is how the brain works. And what we need to do is to understand what its effects are and how to counter them. That's, that's why I'm putting so much emphasis on the importance of facts and truthful information in the reasoning processes, and especially in the political reasoning processes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to ask, I'm sorry. 
Can I keep going? Okay, great. I've been given license to proceed on course. Yes, sir. Fabulous talk. Oh. I'm wondering what a 21st century version of the League of Women Voters would be. Um, well, I'm sorry, I'm 21st asking, century version of? League of Women Voters. Yeah. So I'm going to put out an example. This is not the thing that I think we have to do, but I'm asking you to be more specific with mechanisms. So here's my example. We change our voting system so that you not only vote for which person you want for which role, but when you enter that, you enter, I'm voting with high likelihood that this person will help achieve, and you get to list like four things. That's why I'm voting. And in the League of Women Voters version, before the poll, two weeks before, three weeks before, you could go online and you could do that, and then it would contrast that likelihood. So you believe if this person is elected, unemployment will drop by 50%. And then they will sort of combine the wisdom of experts and elders and say, the consensus view of people who have worked in government, who have worked in business, is that if that person is elected, unemployment at most could drop by 2%. So I'm not, I'm not asking you to respond necessarily to that suggestion, but what can non-governmental agencies, that's my League of Women Voters for the 21st century, do in the weeks before the elections to get voters to see more clearly whether they're voting based on reasoning or emotion? That's my question. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. I was warned that there would be some tough questions. Um, uh, and the warning was valid. Uh, I, have to, I have to tell you that I think the League of Women Voters or any comparably civic-minded organization that deals with the potential results of an election one week before it happens started way too late. Right? So I, don't, I think the one-week time frame is unrealistic. I think at this point... Now, by the way, it might have helped in this particular election since so many of the late deciders uh, made up their mind you know, like within a week of the election. And actually, this is maybe one... But it, it, it's, a, it's a stretch, honestly. So I think the most important thing they can do is not one week. I think, I think to me, I'm going to, I'm going to take a slightly different cut on your question. To me, the most important issue that we deal with, there's two really important issues. One has to do with the role of facts and truth that I try to talk about here. And the second thing has to do with the growing polarization of the American body politic. And we have to ask ourselves, what are the root causes of this polarization? And I think that what's happened here is that it's a consequence that the Supreme Court just upheld it with gerrymandering. So we have to say, we, are, we have single-member districts. I don't think single-member districts is the most democratic way to vote. I don't think the Electoral College is necessarily the fairest way to express democratic will. I think these are two things that need to be, that need to be looked at. And what I would say is that, is that if, if we could have a... Um, a nonpartisan way of drawing congressional district lines that have absolutely nothing to do with putting all one party here and all one party here, uh, I think we'd set a much, much greater chance of having a more representative Congress. Now, if you have a more representative Congress, which is to say it's not made up of the people at, 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 the, at, at the extremes, I think you greatly improve the probability of building consensus. Right now, our Congress, in my view, is effectively polarized. It's polarized because one house has this party, another house has that party, and it's polarized because there are such strong differences of opinion on so many fundamental issues. And I think as long as we have these strong differences of opinion reflected in our lawmaking institutions, and frankly in our executive branch, to some extent actually in the judiciary, I think we're doomed to more polarization. These are self-reinforcing problems, right? What we need to do is to figure out, we're in a closed loop here. The issue is how do we get out of this closed loop? And I don't think we get out of the closed loop unless we give a hard look at the fundamentals, which to me uh, include uh, a, a fair nonpartisan districting to reduce the effects of gerrymandering. I'd like to see them reduced to zero. That would be one thing. And I think it's time to take a second look uh, at the role of the Electoral College in selecting our presidents. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, a brief comment and then a question. When all of this statistical analysis is done, and uh, the results come out as being significant, substantial, consequential, persuasive, remarkable, 
That doesn't move the needle in a polarized environment. It doesn't do it. So, my question is, with all of this um, data and all of this brain power and, and with supercomputers uh, and with everything else being quantifiable in our lives, why can't we get to real numbers when it comes to whether or not all of this effort uh, generated uh, something that's, again, quantifiable? Okay, um, I think I understand your question, but I don't want to go down a false path. If you could just, if you could state it succinctly in a, que in a question form, I'm and saying, I'll, I'll try to deal with this. it. I'm saying this, when statistical information comes out and, and the conclusion is, the result is, it's significant, oh. okay? okay. That mean, I can tell you, I'm a lawyer, th that, doesn't, that doesn't persuade people who are difficult to persuade. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, why can <clears throat> Uh, all of this information come down to actual numbers, or at least a range of numbers. Yeah, you know, this is a this is a really interesting question. Um, the perspective I can't give you a perspective on it from the standpoint of political outcomes, but I want to give you an insight from as a former intelligence officer. So we produce studies. Sometimes they're like the the ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment that I quoted earlier, or National Intelligence Estimates. Um, and sometimes there are other kinds of studies that we provide to policymakers. And policymakers generally get very impatient with numbers. They like words. They would rather hear words like um, most or many or slight, you know. So now the intelligence community has tried it different ways. We've tried to skin this cat several ways. And when we move more toward numbers, so we say, we might say, we believe there's a, a better than 90% probability of something happening, or 95% probability. By the way, it translates into almost certain, right? Or if it's 5% or 10%, they might say uh, very unlikely, right? So these words, these words are imperfect characterization of numbers. But a great philosopher of science, his name is Abraham Kaplan, wrote a book called The Conduct of Inquiry. And he warned us about what he called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And the, that's the problem with numbers. And no policymaker has ever said it quite that way, but I can tell you having interacted with policymakers on issues where you have to convey your findings because most intelligence looks ahead, right? You have to convey your findings in terms of probabilities or likelihoods. You have to give some sense of what might happen under certain conditions. And the closer you get to using numbers, the greater is the discomfort level. So all I can say is I, I wish that we could, from, not just from intelligence, but, but from social science as well, that we could express our findings in ways that are actionable, in ways that can be implemented. And I think we oftentimes, like the, the, the Drew Weston study that I quoted here and the Gunther study from Ohio State on electoral behavior, what I think we need to do is to, is to take it to the next step and say, okay, thank you for all these numbers, now what does it mean, right? What are the, what are the actionable implications from learning this? That's what we have, and what, which is what some of what I tried to do here today. But it's a tough problem. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yes, sir. Uh, in the days of the Soviet Union, Kalugin and his bosses wanted Americans and people in the Soviet Union to think that the United States was more racist and more anti-Semitic than it was. Apparently, according to his book, he said he sent people to draw swastikas. I, on I'm sorry, say Who, whose book? Kalugin. Yes. Kalugin. Oh, you read, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He wanted, and he had people send racist letters to African diplomats in the United, in the UN so that they would then go complain to the press, and it did get picked up. He didn't need the internet. He had the New York Times, presumably, or the, or the New York Post, say that uh, 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 tombstones were pushed over in cemeteries. Did that happen? Did we know about it? Did we do anything about it? If you could tell me, again, the very specific instance. Kal in Kalugin's book, yes. he discusses active measures in the United States. Yes, in the United he States. He said he sent people to draw swastikas on synagogues in Washington and in New York, presumably other places. And it got picked up and so forth. So yeah. did it okay. happen? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I read the Kalugin book a long time ago. I read the Kalugin book a long time ago. Don't remember a lot of the, a lot of the particulars from it. And maybe, maybe it's because of... Half-heimers or some other thing going on, but the, here's the main thing: the bulk of Kalugin's reporting has been has been either substantiated or judged as generally reliable. 
One of the things that we, that we have not done, and this has been a big, this has been a big issue in, uh, in the United States government, is to give a very, very hard look at what's happened in the past. And, is, and they say, let me approach it in two different ways. One is if you look at the, at the past uh, Soviet, not Russian, but Soviet active measures in the United States, their main ally was the Communist Party of the United States of America, CPUSA. And they truly sought influence, partly because they had a distorted conception of how American politics worked. They, they used the CP, the Communist Party of the United States, uh, to try to exert, to exert influence on elections, and were uh, fundamentally failures, fundamentally unsuccessful. So what, what this intelligence community assessment said that I quoted, and this is not actually repeated in the Mueller report, so I want to say it again, is that the level and scope of, of Russian engagement when compared to past Soviet engagement was significantly greater. My God, there I, go. I should use a number, right? By what, uh, by what percentage? But it was significantly greater uh, under, uh, under Putin and uh, under Russia than it had been before in the Soviet Union. And I think the fundamental difference here is the, so that Russia today is not nearly as ideologically driven as the Soviet Union was. So the Soviet policymakers, I think, were in some ways seriously hampered and constrained. And, I, and I've studied Soviet intelligence, and I can tell you that in, in the United States, analysts can have impact. Analysts can influence, can influence discussions in, the, in policy circles because they're listened to on the premise that they are objective. They have no policy axe to grind. Uh, they, have, they have no equities in policy. They're basically neutral, detached observers. That's not the way it happened in the Soviet Union. There was no objective analysis in the Soviet Union. So the whole, the whole idea here is uh, uh, about, about, about influencing uh, policymakers, if you're doing it in foreign countries, the question obviously is, what do you do? Today, Russia has a vastly more sophisticated understanding of American policy and electoral processes than its predecessor, the Soviet Union, ever had. And that's why they're in a different place. They're in a different place in two ways. That's one of them. The other way is that the active measures, and this is, this is post Kalugan, the active measures in Kalugan's time, it was mostly about forgeries, about press placements, about recruiting agents of influence. Today, the cyber role of active measures is extraordinary. And the difference basically is back in the old days, in the Soviet days, it was influenced by speed of hard copy. Today, it's influence at the speed of light. So that's the problem. And when you take a look at the, when you take a look at the trolls and bots and the, and the whole panoply and infrastructure of what the IRA was able to do with U.S. social media, uh, it is quite, quite uh, daunting. And we've not yet figured out a good, uh, good defense to do that. I mean, we have, we have some basic ideas that are a long, long way from implementation. So that's the new world we're in. And I don't know if that answers your question exactly the way you posed it, but, but I would say, I would say uh, uh, in general, I think, the, I think Kalugan's reporting is pretty much on. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello. There's another way to hack, uh, interfere with elections, and that is hacking voter machines that only have electronic <clears throat> records yeah. and no paper trail. Yeah. I know many states have optical scanning machines, which New York State does. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters for that gentleman. <laughs> um, and we've lobbied for paper trails so that, but there are other states that do not have it, and there, it has been done before whether um, they can flip the switches or whatever. So I'm wondering, do you know of any government efforts or what's being done to make sure there's all the voting machines are mandated to have paper trails? Yes, uh, let me comment briefly on that. First, first, first of all, I, I don't have any in-depth knowledge on this, but I can tell you what the Department of Homeland Security has uh, told us about this. We know that the Russians attempted to hack into and penetrate the the election processes, the voting pro I mean, not the, but the electoral processes in 21 states. We believe they succeeded in penetrating three of them and maybe five. Uh, definitely uh, Florida and two other states. There's great debate on what successful penetration means. Right now, I believe there is consensus that no votes were changed. But the takeaway from this is, that was in 2016, what's going to happen in 2020? So I, I think it should be an absolute uh, no-brainer to put huge resources. And by the way, back in 2016, 
Oh, there was some heads up on this, by the way. I mean, the, the, FBI, uh, the FBI alerted the Democratic National Committee in, uh, in June that it was being penetrated. They didn't do anything about the vo voting uh, machines at this point weren't even, weren't even on the radar screen. But they did try to take some measures to, pre to prevent, or at least to give people a heads up that something was going on, right? But we didn't really get a, get a good insight into the ways in which the state's voting machines were targeted and we know that there were attempts in 21 states. We didn't, we didn't, didn't really appreciate that until later. What we need to do between now and the next election is so important and so huge, and I'm sorry I can't give you any updated because I just don't know a uh, 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 sense of, of where we are. But I don't I doubt that it is an extremely important and priority issue because it was not a factor in the 2016 elections. It could be a factor in the next one. And thank you for your question. Okay, the left wins. <laughs> My uh, comment is more of a comment and a warning than it is to be a question. It has an implicit question in it. I'm one of those who has found himself to be, for some reason, maybe my age, uh, maybe other reasons, as being a potential Trump supporter. And the campaign has already begun. And the entry point, interestingly enough, is through ads that sometimes deal with issues of diets, diabetes, that may be the lead in, but when you get to inside the next step, then it starts to be more of a hard sell. So I think as a warning to all of us in our age group, or as potential consumers, it's uh, the Spanish word, what is it, cuidado? Be w beware of what you're reading, because the campaign has already begun. Thank you for that. I appreciate your comment. And yes, sir, for the final question? No, for the final question, um, it wasn't always this way. When we were more of a centrist nation, we had the fairness doctrine for the TV. When we had the fairness doctrine, if TV stations stepped out of bounds, they were fined, their license could be canceled, and we had more incivility. Now, relations look more like studio wrestling. The second Jerry meandering issue that I was concerned with is how I organized my Thanksgiving Day table of people I can't have sit near one another. But the question that I have is you certainly point out the role of the lower brain stem and feelings. This was represented best in a New York Times article where they had a white nationalist and said, I know Trump lied 10,000 times. I know what he's done to woman, women, but he makes me feel good. He makes me feel good, I'm better than the black. He makes me feel good, I'm better than the immigrant. He makes me feel good, and I haven't felt good in a long time. And the question is, everything that you've said and everything that we've heard, and by the way, it was a wonderful talk, um, I think is a, happening in other nations. It's happening in Hungary, it's happening in Poland, it's happening in Italy. And if we had an index that had democratic on one side and authoritarian on the other, I think that we would show that uh, on that dashboard, we are tilting toward a more authoritarian world. Um, yeah, let me just say that uh, I, I thank you for your comment. Uh, I agree with it uh, roughly 100%, if I can exp express, that, uh, express that as a number. The problem, the problem about feeling good uh, is a real problem. And it's, uh, you know, well, we all like to feel good. Uh, the issue, obviously, is when feeling good becomes politically counterproductive, and that is such a subjective issue, it raises the importance of objectivity. And then I, so let me just make one statement on objectivity. Objectivity is hard to achieve. And to achieve it, we have to establish three criteria. One is faithfulness to facts. This is hard to do. Another is to be free of values, and a third is to be free of bias. Those two are even more difficult than being faithful to facts. These are high bars. And I don't think, I don't think we need to meet those high bars in 95% of the decisions we make as human beings. But when it comes to consequences of presidential elections, I think we have to elevate the importance of the role of objectivity in that kind of voter decision making. And I think that's the only way I, I could deal with that one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um,
I know there's a couple other people who want questions, but we can take those privately if you have some. I'd be happy to stay afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for all for coming. Appreciate it. No. Oh, shit. Uh,